Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship as we gather together to worship our great God and Father. Paul writes in Ephesians, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has given us freely in the one he loves. God chose us in him before creation. We're we're considering creation this morning as we begin a new series in the book of Genesis. Before creation, things happened. Everything didn't begin at creation. Before creation, we were chosen in Christ. And God began to put in action his plan to save and redeem for for himself a kingdom for the son that he loves. As we gather in his praise and worship, let's pause in a moment of silent prayer, meditation and reflection as we prepare our hearts for worship. Let's pray. Father, may our worship and may our lives be lived to your praise, to the praise of your glorious grace. Comfort us, fill us with joy and peace as we trust in the Saviour, as we worship Him together this morning as your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All of our songs this morning are about creation. We're going to stand and sing our opening song of praise, How Great Thou Art.
to read some words from Hebrews chapter 4 for our ministry of reconciliation this morning. Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 12. But the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That's interesting because the world perhaps thinks of Christianity as a religion in which we're judged by the things that we do. And the things that we do are what's right and what's wrong. But, but God's word is so much more comprehensive and deeper than that. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Even the things that nobody else can see, the things that, that only exist in your mind, in your, in your thinking, in your consciousness, the attitudes of your heart, God's word has something to say about them too. God's word is alive and active and nothing in all creation is hidden from his sight. Isn't the case we often try to pretend we we pretend that maybe God doesn't know? He does. We, we pretend that things can be hidden, that if we, if we just keep at our distance from God, then he won't know. A bit like Adam and Eve, naked in the garden, hiding behind a bush before the all-seeing God. That's what we do sometimes, isn't it? Let's come to God in prayer now and reveal our hearts and open our hearts to him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, all-seeing and all-knowing God, we humble ourselves before you this morning. Acknowledging that you can see everything about us. You know us better than we know ourselves. And, Father, do, were we not to have the Lord Jesus, then that would be a great, something very fearful for us. We would be trying to hide from you as Adam and Eve did in the garden. We would be trying to present a, a good front towards others, or, or perhaps we would just try to do all the right things and, just, and, and, and hope that the attitudes of our hearts might go undetected. But you know, O oh God, you see, and we do not pretend to hide from you. And we acknowledge and confess the sins of both our actions, our thoughts, and our words before you asking that you would forgive us, that rather than trying to hide from you, we might be honest with you and obtain the forgiveness that we so desperately need. Father, hear us, we pray. Forgive us in your mercy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And the writer to the Hebrews carries on in the very next few verses, giving us reasons for hope. He says, just after acknowledging that God sees all things and nothing is hidden from his sight, everything is uncovered and laid bare, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace. Not with fear, not with, not with hiding, not with disguise. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 
Let's respond in song. We're going to stand and sing two songs. Firstly, from the Psalms, from Psalm 139. Search me, O God. Psalm 139 speaks of that theme that we've just been dwelling on, that, that God sees our un- saw our unformed body in the womb. He, he knows our thoughts. Search me, O God, followed by another song of creation across the lands. Let's stand to sing.
Let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Now, Father in heaven, thank you for the stars and the planets fashioned by your hand, for the skies which declare your glory, for the seas and the land which rejoices. Thank you that we are among them. We declare your glory. We rejoice in the Lord Jesus this morning. We thank you for the sun that is blazing strongly to warm the earth today. And yet our sun, a million times larger than earth, is only one star in perhaps a hundred billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone, which is perhaps only one in a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. What an almighty and extravagant creator you are. What immensity. What a God. And you care for us. You care for us and you love us despite searching us and knowing our hearts. Despite seeing us as we are, you welcome us into fellowship with you and Invite us to your son's table this morning. You are amazing, God. We continue to pray for the work of your kingdom and for the work of gospel in India. We thank you for the evangelistic team who we used of you to continue to proclaim Christ alone. We thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit for... 72 new brothers and sisters of ours who came to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ last month in June. We also together rejoice in your kindness to our brother Yako and his family for answering our prayers for him this week. And truly it was almost no sooner had than we had begun to pray that his cancer would be of the kidney than... You receive the results to confirm that. We rejoice in that and we pray that you would now give strength for the treatment that's to follow. Father, we pray for Eden as she looks forward to being baptized in two weeks' time. Thank you for the love for the Lord Jesus that you've given her and thank you that she can profess that faith to us all and receive the sign of baptism in our presence. We pray for members of our congregation who are in state at this time, and especially for any who might struggle to return to us because of border closures and lockdowns. We pray that you would give grace and strength for the challenges that this brings. And truly, Father, we do long for a day in which all those disruptions will be in an end. Thank you for everyone who has filled our pulpit over the last four weeks while I've been away for faithful and heartfelt preaching that has glorified the Lord Jesus and magnified the gospel. Father, we also want to dedicate our gifts and offerings to you in prayer, the gifts that we've given this morning for our local church and for our diaconate, for the gifts that we've given online and through bank transfers during the week. A thankful for your many blessings to us. And even as we read of creation this morning, we are reminded that this world belongs to you. The cattle on a thousand hills are yours. Even the smallest coin in our wallet or bank balance belongs to you. And it would be blasphemous for us to think that we could repay you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for giving us opportunities such as this to express gratitude and the gifts that we've given. Would you open our hearts now to the reading and preaching of your word this morning as we sit under its ministry. May it be a double-edged sword to us. May it discern the deepest aspects of our heart, our, our fears and our worries. May you give comfort and guidance to us in that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to our scripture readings this morning. 
Our first two readings are from the New Testament, from the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, followed by Colossians chapter 1, followed by Genesis chapter 1. John, Colossians, Genesis. readings we are hearing what God speaks to us, what God's message to us is regarding creation. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Secondly, we turn to Colossians chapter 1. Speaking of the work of the Lord Jesus and how he sustains the world that he has made. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Our final reading is in Genesis, beginning in chapter 1 and into chapter 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening. And there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. 
And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock and the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the word of God. Is there anything that is certain in our world right now? except that everything is uncertain. I was recovering from a state of weakness and depletion, as you know, in COVID safe New Zealand when a traveller from Sydney flew into Wellington and all hell broke loose, metaphorically speaking. He returned home, tested positive for COVID in Sydney and New Zealand's capital went into panic. Only a few more days pass and the travel free, uh, tra quarantine free travel bubble is suspended and incoming flights to New Zealand are cancelled. I um, escape uh, back, to, back to Brisbane uh, just in time for Brisbane's three day lockdown. This week I discovered that a foster care conference that Lydia and I were to attend on the Gold Coast at the end of the week has been suspended because the NRL has taken over our hotel. We have members of the congregation uh, stuck overseas, not, not stuck overseas, stuck interstate. I've got a week-long conference in Sydney at the end of August. Anyone want to, to give me odds that that's not going to go ahead? One thing after another. Should I get vaccinated if my preferred vaccine isn't available for my age group yet? How do I weigh up the possibility, the risks of, of, of illness versus, versus illness? And when will it all end? Is there anything that's certain in our world right now except that everything is uncertain? God's people had a different set of uncertainties and fears living in their world. Genesis is written largely by Moses, perhaps largely written during the 40 years of desert wanderings. 
Escape from Egypt was a good thing until disobedience and fear led to 40 years in the desert. Is my God powerful enough to bring me into the promised land? Or were we defeated because the gods of Canaan are the stronger? Well, think of Israel in the time of exile. Disobedience in the promised land has led to removal, exile from the land. Sojourn in in Babylon. Are Babylon's gods which defeated us, are they more powerful than our God? Are we on the losing side with a weaker God? Is there any hope for us? Is there any hope for the future? Are God's promises of a return and a brighter future, are those promises able to be relied upon? Can I believe the promises? Friends, it's into a world of uncertainty and fears that the book of Genesis is written. This book wasn't written in the abstract to let us debate the age of the earth or the length of a day. This is a book written for a different purpose, written to give comfort to God's people then. I hope you'll agree, a book written to give comfort to God's people today as well. To help us to gain confidence in the future. To help us gain confidence in our God. To help us see and embrace God's kingdom in the messiness of life in a fallen world. Genesis was written to give us hope. And it all begins in the beginning. God's word creates a kingdom. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. In short, God created the universe, the earth, that is the land, and the heavens. Not not heaven, not heaven where where God is, where God dwells, but but the heavens, the the sky, the the space, the, the universe. In the beginning, God created everything. And God created everything by his word. Through Jesus, the word, as we read earlier in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Or again in Colossians chapter 1. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And especially in that last reading in Colossians 1, you might think that Colossians is simply telling us a second time what what John in his gospel has already told us. There's a little bit more, isn't there? All things have been created through him, through Jesus, what John tells us. But he tells us one other thing. He says, all things have been created for him. How has the universe been created for Jesus? So that. At the end of all of human history, at the end of this era of human history, everything, all people, all things, all creation might be brought to unity in Jesus. And every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. King Jesus will sit upon his throne and all creation, indeed the entire universe, will acknowledge his kingship for creation is his kingdom. A king needs a kingdom. You can't really be a king without a region to govern and citizens who recognize you as king. Only then can you rule gloriously. Only then can you be seen to be wise in the way that you reign. Only then can your goodness be displayed in the way your kingdom's governed. Only then can you have The preeminence, the supremacy. And so, in the beginning, God the Father created 
through God the Son, with the presence of God the Spirit hovering over the waters. In the beginning, God created not merely our world and the universe. God didn't merely create our world, but our world as his kingdom. Our world is a kingdom in which the king is supreme. In the beginning, the whole earth was God's kingdom. And if sin hadn't entered the kingdom, as we'll go on to see next Sunday in the next few chapters, the kingdom would still be today as it was back then. But sin enters the kingdom bringing death and destruction. And as time progresses, all but one of the citizens of the kingdom, Noah, inclined their hearts to evil all the time. The flood cleanses the kingdom. And then the kingdom begins again. It's narrower next time around. At least initially. God's word, God's promised word, creates the promise of the kingdom afresh. Abraham is promised the kingdom. The promised land. Land, exactly the same word that's used here in verse 1 for God's creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the land. Promised land for Abraham and his offspring. But even when Abraham made his home in the promised land, his hope wasn't fixed then. He, He didn't get there and think, I've arrived, I've got the promise. This is the land. This is the kingdom that I've been promised. Now, even when Abraham was living in the land, his eyes were looking beyond the land. Hebrews 11 tells us that he was looking ahead to a city. A city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He was looking ahead to a greater kingdom. Jesus came to usher in the kingdom. And it's with Jesus that we begin to see that while the kingdom narrowed for a time in its scope, land in the Middle East, God's plan has always been for a kingdom to fill the earth. King Jesus has the authority for this task. We're told in the Great Commission that that Jesus has all authority in heaven and in the land. There's our word again. Same word. All authority in heaven and and the land. And it ends in Revelation 21 and 22 with a new universe, new land. A new kingdom. And the king seated upon his throne, making everything new, recreating everything afresh. Evil is expelled from his kingdom forever. And we, the servants of the lamb, will serve the king before his throne. That's what we see in Genesis 1. Not the mere creation of matter and life, amazing and as wonderful as that is, but God's word creating a kingdom. And the presence of the God whose word is so powerful comforts us as we wait with endurance for the coming of the kingdom that will never end, the kingdom that will come in all its fullness. We battle uncertainties and fears and anxieties. We gain confidence in the future and in our God. We see and embrace God's kingdom amidst the messiness of life in a fallen world. Genesis was written to give us hope. And the second thing we see is that in the beginning... God's word shapes and fills his kingdom. God's word creates a kingdom. And then God's word shapes and fills his kingdom. In the beginning, we're told the kingdom is described. In the beginning, the kingdom was formless and empty. Don't you imagine yourself lost in the middle of a desert? 
There are sand dunes everywhere, just flowing all sorts of, they're being whipped up by the wind. There's no definite form. They're always shifting and changing in the winds. That's what Genesis 1 is describing, describing here. A, a watery desert. Total chaos in the midst of darkness. Blackness. The kingdom is yet to take shape. It's yet to be a place where, where the king can be worshipped by his creation. First, there must be some terraforming. The kingdom must be shaped into an environment that's capable of sustaining life. It's by God's word that Christ's kingdom is shaped. And God said, it's all that it takes. All that it takes. God's powerful word shapes a life-sustaining world and then fills that world with life. There's a balanced pattern to the shaping and filling of the creation, which you may have noticed and many people have observed over the years. Days, days one to three has the shaping and days four to six, the, the, the mirrored filling, if you want to put it like that. So on day one, the light is created. On day four, the light bearers, the sun and the moon and the stars. On day two, the sky and the sea are separated. On day five, the sky and the sea are filled with birds and fish. On day three, the land and vegetation are created. On day six, the land dwellers who, who feed on that vegetation are created. God's word shapes and then fills his kingdom. And as this takes place, there are a few things that shouldn't escape our attention and observation this morning. If you have your Bible open, when were the sun and the moon created? Anyone got a Bible open? When were the sun and the moon created? What day were they created on? No one has a Bible open. No one can read that quickly. Yes, Riley. Fourth day. On the fourth day. <laughs> Mostly correct. Mostly correct. But if you actually have your Bible open and look carefully, you'll see that the sun and moon are not named. Did you notice that? Instead, we're told, what are we told? God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. Why are they not named? I mean, the Hebrews had names for sun and moon. Why are they not mentioned? I mean, they mentioned elsewhere in the scripture. Why are they not named in the creation account? Think for a moment about where Israel's living. Where have they just come from when they heard these words afresh? They've come from Egypt, haven't they? Ra, the sun god. Hathor, the moon god. They're not even around in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The sun and the moon don't even exist until day four. And they're not named. They're, they're, it's like they're insignificant. The stars thought to influence and shape human destiny. Think astrology. They're just thrown in as an afterthought. He also made the stars. Billions of them as, there are, as they are. You see, friends, Genesis 1 isn't just teaching. It's reshaping and correcting Israel's worldview and opposing the pagan myths of her neighbors around her. Genesis 1 were being rewritten today, it would be being rewritten in a way that would, that would speak against secular naturalism, that the idea that, that there is no God and that everything just happened just like that. Are you wandering in the desert, Israel? Are you wondering if your God will prevail and if his promises are dependable? If your God is more powerful than the gods of the nations around you? Yes. 
Yes, he's the all-powerful God who speaks powerful words, a God whose promises are certain and sure. Or you could look back to the ancient mythologies of Babylon and her creation stories. The Enuma Elish is one of them. And you could witness there, as you read the stories of Babylon, the struggle that the Babylonian gods had to separate the waters from the land. And our God, he just speaks the word and it happens. God shapes and fills his kingdom effortlessly. Are you in exile in Babylon wondering if your God is powerful enough to bring you out from the gods of Babylon and bring you back to his promised land? Fear not, your God is the all-powerful God who speaks powerful words, a God whose promises are certain and sure. Further, look at the powerful words that God speaks to shape and fill his kingdom. Ten words, in fact. Ten times we find in our text, and God said. Ten words. How is that significant? We're a little bit cut off and removed from it in English because we tend to speak not of the ten words but of the ten commandments. But in Jewish, in, to a Jewish mind, to, a, to, to, to the Jewish way of thinking, they're not the ten commandments, they're the ten words. And again, they do something similar. With the first ten words in Genesis 1, God shapes and fills his kingdom. And with the next set of ten words in, in Exodus chapter 20, God shapes and fills his people to live according to the standards of the kingdom. The God who brings order and goodness out of chaos, out of a dark, formless, empty world, speaks order and goodness to his kingdom people. And our very same God is still shaping and filling his kingdom according to his powerful words today. You see, the kingdom isn't to be like a shaped masterpiece, uh, anchored in time like, like a museum, like something static, like something unchanging. It's supposed to be filled with light. The prophet Isaiah says it in Isaiah 46. He says, but this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned it and made the earth, he founded it. He did it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. Genesis 1 tells us of the first shaping and filling of God's kingdom. But that shaping and filling continues. God still fills his kingdom by his powerful word, doesn't he? God still speaks his word to the dead and brings life. God still shapes his kingdom by his powerful word as he speaks gospel, life and truth into, into our hearts. The depths of our hearts and souls. How is God shaping your life in 2021? What truths are reshaping you? How is God refining you, chipping away at the old nature and, 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 and its place, developing something, cultivating something beautiful, a beautiful garden, a beautiful new creation in you? More than that, God fills his kingdom with people, with people remade, reshaped in his image. Men and women were first made in God's image in verse 26, which accounts for many of the things that we share. It accounts for our yearning for justice and goodness, our longing for beauty, our longing for love, our, our need for companionship. And now we are remade in God's image a second time. We are remade in the image of Jesus, his son, who in Colossians 1, 
who is the image of the invisible God. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish, free from accusation. You see, Genesis 1 isn't static, fix, a fixed moment back in time a very long time ago. Genesis 1 is moving and going places. That's the trajectory. That's the, that's the path that history is following. The kingdom has been created. The kingdom is being shaped and, and filled by God's powerful word. And one day that kingdom will be ours forever. And ever. Never. But now, for the time being, we live in the midst of uncertainty. A time when often the only thing, it feels like the only thing that's certain is that everything is uncertain. But that, friends, is only how it feels. Things aren't always the way that they feel. Now, feelings can mislead us and they tell us lies. That's how it feels, but that's not how it really is. For God's powerful, filling, shaping word, that's what's certain. God's promises are what are sure. And will not the God who creates, the God who shapes, the God who fills his kingdom, keep and sustain his kingdom and his people? Against all threats. Will he not do that? Amen, he will. Our God is greater than any asteroid, star, or, or galaxy, indeed the whole universe. He created everything good. And in his good and almighty hands, we are safe forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Thanks, Father, for the glory of your creation that we still get to enjoy and see around us today. Thank you that we can see your power and your beauty, your immensity, your, your power, and your love. That you care for us. That you give us this world as a gift. Father, we pray that we might see your glory as we live in the kingdom of Christ. Thank you that you are making a kingdom. That you are shaping and filling a kingdom, even with us. We pray that you might continue that work of powerfully shaping our lives. You would continue your work of powerfully filling your kingdom with, with worshippers. Help us to hold on to our confidence in you in the midst of many of the uncertainties that we face. We thank you that you are a faithful God. You are ever true. You are ever sure. We thank you that we are in your hands, your almighty hands. We give thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together of God's creation further as we sing indescribable. You are amazing, God. Let's stand to sing together.
Lord Jesus, today it is our joyful privilege and solemn duty to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul with respect to the Supper from 1 Corinthians 11. Paul writes, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Those last words, until he comes. That stirs up within us the hope of his return, does it not? He commanded us to do this until he comes. And so the Lord assures us that he will come again and take us to be with him. We will celebrate the feast together in his kingdom. Jesus said he would not drink from the cup again, not drink from the vine until he drank, drank it anew with us. In his kingdom. And Lord Jesus will surely do what he has promised. We shall eat and drink in a never ending feast forever and ever and all eternity. And this hope is secure for us because God's word is powerful. His promises are sure. And his love is certain. For all who live in rebellion against God and in unbelief. This bread and this wine which we will share together would only bring you further condemnation. If you do not yet confess the Lord Jesus and seek to live under his gracious reign, the scriptures warn you this morning to abstain, to let the tray pass you by. However, all who repent and believe are invited to the sacred meal, not because you are worthy in yourself, but because you come clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ, so do not allow the weaknesses of your faith or your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table, for it is given to us precisely for that reason, precisely to account for and, and to assure us that despite our weaknesses and our failures, we are fed with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, who died for us. Let us draw near to Christ then, believing that he will strengthen us in faith, Unite us in love and establish us more firmly in the hope of his coming. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. We remain seated. We're going to sing the first verse of... Psalm 103, the Lord's Supper Psalm. And while we're singing, I'll ask the elders and uh, Ed and Nathan to come forward and help make the table ready. Thank you. <laughs> Receive it in faith, and when all have received, we will eat together. We hear these words of promise that speak to the character 
of our God in Psalm 116. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O my soul. For the Lord has been good to you. We hear these words in Psalm 111, also from the Psalms. Great are the works of the Lord. And we who are hearing these words on the other side of the cross surely turn our mind and our heart to the cross of Christ. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds. We would include creation amongst that, surely. And his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. The Lord feeds us with food this morning. Not for our stomachs, but for our souls. He feeds us with his word. He feeds us with his promises. Let us rejoice in Christ. and sisters, take, eat, remember and believe that the precious body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken, was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. seated let us sing again from Psalm 103 stanza 2 Receive it in faith, and when we have all received, we will drink together. We hear these words in the Psalm, Psalm 145. Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works. 
and I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. We have seen the goodness and righteousness of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why we rejoice this morning. We've seen his goodness in creation. He created everything good. He created his son most excellently good. And in Christ we have the righteousness of God by faith. Brothers and sisters, take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for a complete atonement. That means a, a peacemaking, a reconciliation between us and God. His blood was shed for the complete atonement of all our sins. Sing together, stanza three. your only son we give you thanks this morning we give you thanks in humility for we are deserving of nothing your wonderful treasures of mercy and grace poured out upon us you have set your love upon us and we rejoice in your goodness thank you for giving us our saviour for his body and blood broken and shed for us. Father, we long for the day when we will drink anew with Jesus in his Father's kingdom, when we will see him face to face. Until that day, O oh God, would you continue to shape and fill us by your Holy Spirit. Draw us closer to one another, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's stand and sing together the final stanza of Psalm 103, stanza 4. just sung the sun and the moon they are not gods they bow down before him as israel sang these words so many thousand years ago they look to the god who created all things and sustains all things may we also look to the lord this week for his blessing 
for his strength. May we be filled and shaped by his spirit and by his powerful word. And as we do so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and grant you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. My name is Pastor Andrew and you've been worshipping with us today at the Christian Reformed Church of Toowoomba. Whether you're local to Toowoomba, whether you're joining us from somewhere else in Australia or around the world, we're glad that you could join us as we worship our great God and Saviour together. Especially if you're local, we would love to see you. We'd love to meet you and have you join us for worship. That's part of God's plan for humanity, that we gather together as his people and worship as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you'd like to join us, a church that exists to glorify God by growing in faith, sharing our hope and serving in love, then we would love to see you. You can visit our website at toowoombacrc.com or visit our Facebook page. Either way, you'll be able to get in touch with me and find out when our service times are. We'd love to see you with us. Wherever you are, though, may God be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.